this is our problem statement. How does civil affairs affect operations in a mega city environment? And we're looking right there, back to, right? Multi-domain operation. We have to keep that in mind. MDO, TRADOC, FORCECOM, this is our new stuff. My name is Sergeant Sarah Kelly, and today's Civil Affairs podcast is going to be an episode on mega cities and civil affairs. I am interviewing Major James Ontiverios, and he is here with me now. Hello, sir. Hey, Sergeant Kelly. Sarah, thank you for having me. Well, thank you for being on here and being with the podcast. Can you explain a little bit of your military history and how you came about to be in civil affairs? So I joined the Army in the 90s. I was a field artilleryman uh, as an NCO, 13 Foxtrot. I spent some time in the 10th Mountain, 25th ID. And it was when I was in the 10th Mountain and we were working military operations on urbanized terrain that I was like, wow, what are we gonna do in cities? I left the active duty, got my degree, I commissioned in 2003, and I went straight into the reserves after that. Uh, and then I joined Civil Affairs in 2007, as soon as I was done with the qualification course. Uh, deployed to Bakuba, Iraq, where I served in a company, CMOC, and I also served on a Civil Affairs team as well. And that's when we were in Bakuba. I was really got to learn about how a city functions. The reasons why we're bringing you on today is you seem to be an expert in mega cities, having published within the Special Warfare Journal in October and December of 2018. I wouldn't say an expert, but a lot of the information I'm getting are from the leaders in this field. Guys like John Spencer at the Modern War Institute, uh, Dr. Russell Glenn, who's a trade G2 right now, who published the RAND, the cadre at the IDB, who uh, helped me out with the mega cities. So, you know, I'm taking all of this and aggregating it to kind of learn more about mega cities. Well, let's start. What really is a mega city? So, a mega city, there's so many definitions of it. There is a lot of discussion, a lot of argument about it. But just generally speaking, it's a city with a population in excess of over 10 million. That's a lot of people in one city in the dense urban areas. For fun fact, Tokyo is the number one and Shanghai, China is the number two mega city in the world. And currently, as of 2019, there's actually 47 mega cities. 47 mega cities. So just in the US NORTHCOM AOR, our area of responsibility for NORTHCOM, you've got New York City, Los Angeles, and we also have Mexico City. As you look at US Indo-PACOM, there are 13 mega cities to date in that AOR. So when we look at mega cities, right, you're looking at the core population in excess of 10 million. But if you're looking at the metropolitan area, I mean, Jakarta, Indonesia in the city core is 10 million, just over. If you're looking at Jakarta, Indonesia, within the metroplex, you're looking at almost 32 million people. That, when you break it down, that's almost 5,000 people per square kilometer. Food, water, clothing, commerce. What happens if a natural disaster strikes and Indo-PACOM has to take the lead on that with our joint partners? Civil affairs, what are you gonna do? Well, what are some of the physical challenges just looking at these areas, would you say? I just came from uh, Delta Company 3rd Battalion, 1st Special Warfare Training Group. I was the Phase 3 and Phase 4 Force Manager for the Captain's Career Course on the reserve co- for the Reserve Component, encompassing National Guard and our uh, use of KPOC brethren. When we were working on those exercises in Pineland, myself and the cadre are awesome NCOs there. We looked at how can we turn the Pineland experience for our Reserve Component students into a conventional fight. So we cracked open FM6-0, FM30 operations, and we figured out a way to create a maneuver overlay, a template to fight in Pineland. That, when you look at it on the map in the overlay, that's an XY coordinate system. Mega cities, in real life, I'm looking at X and Y, north and south, but then I gotta look at the Z axis as well. What's above me? skyscrapers, apartment buildings, what's below me, tunnels, train systems, sewer systems. So you have to look at it from a 3D perspective. The x-axis, the y-axis, but now we're incorporating the z-axis as well. What about in terms of the populace? How would you say the different challenges in that aspect would be? As we look at New York City, think of how diverse that population is within the city. You've got the five boroughs, but even within the boroughs, you have different sections. Like, I could literally, in New York City, cross the street and go from 
Little Italy to Chinatown. And I've got two completely different cultures within the US. Imagine that in a mega city. I am in Mumbai, India, and I walk from one sector or I travel into another sector and I've got a completely different ethnic group, language, cultural norms. C8, let's get to it. What are you gonna do? How do you focus? How do you consolidate your operations to make sure you're doing everything for the maneuver commander? Whether you just gotta make sure you're doing right what's within his or her operational guidance. And it seems with more and more cities growing, out of quote from your article that you had written, you actually used the quote from Out of the Mountains, Coming of the Urban Gorilla by David Kilcullen on the four trends of what the future environment's gonna be, which is the rapid population growth, accelerating urbanization, elitorization, which is when people cluster on coastlines, as well as the increasing connectivity of everything. Can you further explain kind of what that actually is and that he's talking about there? Absolutely, so David Kilcullen, he wrote the book Counterinsurgency. He worked on General Petraeus' staff. He is an expert in counterinsurgency. So his book talks about the urban guerrilla moving from the mountains to the city. Our soldiers have been fighting in Iraq, fighting in Afghanistan. The entire fight was coin, not everything, but a lot of the operations occurred in rural areas. Imagine having to do this in a city like the size of Mumbai, Jakarta. I keep going back to Jakarta because it's such an interesting city. And as you look at it, rapid population growth. Rural areas with the advent of technology and agriculture, there isn't really a need for so many farm workers or people out in the pastoral areas. So they begin to migrate to city centers, to urban areas to make a living because, you know, everybody's got to earn an income to feed their families, you know, get their children a proper education. That right there is starting to begin the acceleration of urbanization. And when you have urbanization accelerating in that rapid of a pace, can the city government actually keep up with the needs of the people? So now we're having the concept of mega slums come up as well. These densely populated urban areas where people have makeshift sewer systems, garbage systems, you know, school systems, everything sort of ad hoc, and it just puts extra stress on the uh, city center for that. So what would it be that would make civil affairs even venture into these mega cities? One of them deals with one of our new core competencies. What if we have to execute the CA supported activity of foreign humanitarian assistance, right? We need to reduce and relieve human suffering. Let's say there's a natural disaster. Again, Jakarta, Indonesia, metro populace, 30 plus million, 5,000 people estimated per square kilometer. Indo-PACOM calls upon us as use of elements to go out and provide that assistance. What are we gonna do to affect civil affairs operations in these areas? In terms of the mega cities and the populace and resources control, what kind of resources are the most important factors of it? Clean water. That is above and beyond. If we're looking to provide populace and resources control to an affected area, especially one that just had a disaster, we're looking to reduce or relieve that humanitarian suffer. We, we need to do that as quickly as possible. So in those times of civil or military emergencies, me, priority number one, clean water. We have to get the populace clean water. Because if you don't, people will revert to whatever resources are available. And what if those resources are contaminated? There was an earthquake. Now we've got sewage and a clean water source. People are drinking it. Now the second order effect, we've got a cholera outbreak. Now we are compounding an issue that we could have solved. So for me, the biggest resource is access to clean water for everybody. Next, we move into clothing, shelter. We need to get the populace. We just need to meet their basic needs. Think of the earthquake in Haiti. Buildings are collapsing. People are confused. They're disoriented. You know, we need to, with the assistance of our unified action partners, those NGOs, IPIs, Indigenous Populations and Institutes, we need to work with them and through them to start alleviating that immediate humanitarian suffering. And if you actually look at the maps, almost all of these mega cities are by coastline areas and along rivers. It kind of goes back to the littoralization of these mega cities. And can you talk a little bit more about that? And yes, uh, littoralization, you know, as you said, Sarah, it's the 
migration of humans toward waterfronts, especially as the global market is starting to expand. We're shipping goods to and from locations. This is where the jobs are. Those jobs drive the economy. And again, it goes back to Kilcullen's concept of that rapid population growth. Accelerated urbanization is putting a strain on the local governments. It seems like a lot of poorer folks are coming into these mega cities and creating shanty towns right. and lack of jobs. It does how deeply divided does that against the people who are already residents of the city versus these newcomers of it? That's hard to say because you know, with the number of mega cities, every population center is going to be affected differently. But if I were a taxpayer in a mega city, and now I realize that our resources, the funding that we're providing is being diverted some of to folks who aren't paying tax. I'm sure there would be some sort of, there would be some animosity there. And but what about the housing? So like, where are these people, when they're coming into these cities, where are they actually living? They actually build these ad hoc communities. In Lagos, Nigeria, there's one, I, I can't remember the name of it, but it was actually built on stilts. So imagine us as civil affairs trying to affect civil affairs operations in a city that's actually built on stilts. How are we getting to and from? It just compounds our problem set. But like if you look at in the early 2000s to about the mid uh, teens in Caracas, Venezuela, there was a superstructure, a skyscraper known as Centro Financiero con Finanzas, or they also call it Torre de David, the Tower of David. It was an abandoned skyscraper in the heart of Caracas, Venezuela, that was taken over by squatters. So at its peak, and they're estimating that was about 2010, 2011, there were almost 5,000 people living in this skyscraper. So they had developed their own water system, their own sewage system. And that just goes to the ability for people in an adverse situation to really take an initiative and just create working infrastructure for themselves. But imagine if we could compound El Torre David times 100 in a mega city as civil affairs soldiers, how are we going to conduct CAO, civil affairs operations, in this type of environment? And what's even more difficult is our maneuver forces. How are they going to conduct operations in these areas as well? Just like Kilcullen talks about, imagine an insurgency occurring. It's almost like a scene out of Judge Dredd, to be honest with you. It's funny, but what if that were the case? Especially with 5,000 people living in an abandoned skyscraper, how are we going to affect civil affairs if there's a cholera outbreak? People are being subjugated. What are we going to do? How do we do it? And these are questions that don't yet have answers. And, you know, this is why I really want to bring this topic about because our younger generation, those brand new civil affairs captains and lieutenants, and those civil affairs sergeants, whether it's active component, reserve component, or National Guard, you know, these are the problems they're going to face 2035, 2049. We need to start looking forward on this. In terms of civil affairs, especially with the, the traditional core competencies, how would it begin to even approach a mega city? I think our doctrine writers have really leaned forward in this, especially having worked at the Special Warfare Center and meeting them. Uh, we've moved from the five core tasks that we had that were very very broad. One of the core tasks did not even have an army techniques publication that addressed it. But now the doctrine writers took a look at it and they're like, hey, we're going to create the civil affairs core competencies, civil affairs activities, military government operations, and civil affairs supported activities. Within the civil affairs activities, my commander at 3rd Battalion, Colonel John M. Wilcox, beat it into our students' head. Civil engagement, civil reconnaissance. You gotta know how to do those. So with that, as CA on the conventional side, we go into a disaster area, we need to start executing that civil engagement. Finding out, like we jokingly say, who's who in the zoo? Who are the key leaders? Who are the power players? Who do we need to be in contact with? Then we conduct that civil reconnaissance. We're looking at public works. We're looking at infrastructure. We're looking at food distribution systems. And we're taking this back to the maneuver units and sharing it with the brigade S3, the battalion S3, just so they can build their common operating picture and start incorporating that layer of the civil component. And this is where those CMOCs come into play. I know a lot of our formations are short-staffed and we want to concentrate our forces within the CATS, civil affairs team, but uh, we really need to round out our CMOCs. 
That way, a CMOC at, at a brigade or a division level has that ability to reach out to those cats down at the maneuver units and really focus their efforts and affect operations in mega cities rather than do what we jokingly call cowboy CA. You're not affecting civil affairs that's in line with the commander, his or her vision or uh, end state. You're doing your own thing. No, we need to bring it back and focus on those civil affairs activities. And that's where civil engagement, civil reconnaissance, we got to be, we got to get better at SIM. CMOC operations have to be on point. And then how do we incorporate our civil affairs officers into civil affairs operations support to the maneuver staff? The commander's concerned about, you know, let's say it was not so much a disaster, but maneuver fight. He or she is focusing on their forces, the enemy. Hey man, this is where we rounded out at CA. We gotta worry about the civil component. That's our thing. And it goes back to those 13 branch principles. I think it's number three that states the civil component is a critical factor of military operations. Fourth one, civil affairs are civil component oriented. Looking at that, right? Civil affairs component is critical in all military operations. I'm just gonna kind of do a sidebar. I did a warfighter while I was in third battalion with a good friend of mine, Master Sergeant Clint Unger, and we supported a National Guard maneuver enhancement for me. So we were thinking, okay, Clint and I, our experience had been as at the CAT level, whether it was deployed or at a CTC, working with that maneuver battalion commander. Got the three battalions, you know, we had done some brigade stuff, but we had never worked the rear the division rear. So we went in there naively thinking like, we're gonna put our past experiences to work. Once we realized how big during this water fighter exercise the division rear was, and something we never took into account were the pass backs. Those IDPs that were moving through the battalion, AOs through the brigade and coming into us, we were getting four maneuver battalions, where even though it was notional, we were getting their pass backs and having to figure out what are we gonna do with these IDPs. So imagine that something happens in a city core, People are like, I'm out of here. Think of an earthquake in Mexico City. People start moving out. What are we gonna do with all those folks? You know, that's where we really have to work with our unified action partners, those NGOs, IPIs that we talked about earlier to help those folks out. But looking at that, when we did our AAR, the commander talked about friendly forces, the OCT team talked about the enemy forces, and we moved on to the next topic, but Clint and I were like, oh, hey, can we stop? And then we brought up like, you gotta talk about the civil component, because going back to branch principle number three, that civil component is a critical factor in all military operations, because the CA, Right, we mitigate civilian interference in the commander's maneuver operations, but we also work to keep those military operations out of civilian areas well, as best we can, right? The end state, the mission, that takes priority, but we try to build that operating picture for the commander in terms of civil affairs and the civil component. I get passionate about that. It seems that it does help with the commanders, especially when it comes to times like the urban warfare. Mm -hmm. Civil affairs can kind of give you an idea of different neighborhoods. How would you say the knowledge of that benefits the commanders when it comes to warfare type or insurgents? One of the best examples, actually watch the video on YouTube and also listen to the podcast, the Modern Warfare Institute. I believe it was John Ambley. Don't remember, but they interviewed Colonel Pat Work, who was a brigade commander of the 82nd Airborne when they pushed through Mosul. The Iraqi forces led the effort, but Colonel Work's soldiers were supporting them throughout the entire operation. And one of the things he talked about was it was just slow grinding operations. And if folks take a look, you just go to the Center for Army Lessons Learned, pull up the Mosul study group, AAR. It just really shed a light on these operations because not only were they trying to push through Mosul, now they've got to cross the river and get into the other part of the city. They're looking at how are these military operations impacting the populace? How do we keep from accidentally killing civilians and then turning them against our efforts? It's complex, you know. These operations are they're not easy, and they require our soldiers, our civil affairs soldiers, to really start thinking critically and thinking creatively on how we're going to solve these problem sets. And that's one thing we tried at the Captain's Career Course. We would briefly touch over Army design methodology. What does the current environment look like? What do we want it to look like? What's our problem statement? And how do we build an operational approach? Those lines of effort that are going to be in line with the commander's lines of effort in terms of the civil populace. 
And that's where we're right. We were talking about CMOC operations or at the brigade and above or civil affairs operations staff support at the maneuver battalion level. Man, that's where you got to be as the cat team leader. You at this maneuver battalion, you might be ad hoc S9 for the battalion as well. You're wearing two hats. You're working in the MDMP. You're working in the TLPs with, with the cat MDMP with the uh, maneuver battalion. Man, you got to be on point. You got to be integrated, man. You got to be in that S3's pocket. You got to be in the XO's ear like, hey, I'm looking at your operation. I'm talking to the S2. This is what I see from this uh, course of analysis you guys, course of action analysis you guys are doing. Hey, I've got my new 357, all the doctrines. Hey, these are my inputs for this operation. There, we can make sure that that civil component, that maneuver unit understands that that's a critical factor in all military operations. And that as civil affairs, we are civil oriented. I hope that answered the question. Very important because you have those who aren't always agreeing, they're more willing to maybe take up arms depending on how it is, but civil affairs, commanders or civil affairs can maybe help identify the areas that are maybe more likely to yeah. pick up the arms. And that comes through the what, civil information aspect of it? Right, we're doing civil information management. I'm trying to get everything I can from the civil environment and just try to process it to provide the commander a good picture of the com you know, what's going on in his, his or her AOR. And you had mentioned, right, we talked about civil affairs activities, civil affairs supported activities, and then boom, the next one, military government operations. This is going to be critical. We've got our 38 golf program. We really, from my foxhole, is the S3 of 450th Civil Affairs Battalion, Airborne. Are we using our 38 golfs correctly? <laughs> Man, that is going to be a huge win if we're able to cultivate this resource. I, if it were me, I would actually look at consolidating. But if I could take 38 golfs out of the battalions, consolidate them at the brigade or KCOM level, that's where our subject matter expertise is gonna pop in. We need those 38 golfs, whether they are experts in industry production, law regulations, policy, energy, corrections, emergency management, education, commerce, and finance. If they're consolidated at these two major headquarters, they could possibly get that training they're going to need. Instead of being that one lone 38 golf operating in a battalion of nothing but 38 alphas. But they can work on those problem sets of transitional military authority or uh, support civil administration, those two functions that fall under military government operations. We can focus on those functional specialty areas, like I had mentioned before, with the ASIs they've got for 38 golfs. But man, we look at security, justice and reconciliation, humanitarian assistance and social well-being, governance and participation, and even economic stabilization. And boom, infrastructure, right? Infrastructure is so critical because it goes back to what we we're talking about. When you ask what's yeah. important, public works, dad gum, man, we got to get that stuff up and running. Water, sewer, electric, academic, trash. Man, any old CA person will tell you right there. That is a sweat MSO right there. Looking at the infrastructure, that's what we work on. And with mega cities, do we have to revise the way we look at this? You know how Civil Affairs has its own areas of operations, how they divide up the country, Southcom and Centcom and whatnot? Do you think there maybe should be a section that just focuses on mega cities? Yes, absolutely. How it would work to have a team dedicated to figuring out the issues in a mega city. It's going to be different in ARs. U.S. Northcom, Mexico City. Earthquake happens, the Mexican government says, hey, we need your help. How we provide assistance may not fundamentally differ from Indo-PACOM to Northcom, but the systems, right? We're thinking systems here. Water system, electric system, going to be completely different. I think I like your point there is if, you know, the guys out in California, 351, has a focus team on mega cities, it can be an operational planning team. Bring those guys together. 06 Colonel heading it up. All your 38 golfs, your experienced 38 alphas, your CMOC chief. Problem. This is our problem statement. How does civil affairs affect operations in a mega city environment? And we're looking right back, back to, right, multi-domain operation. We have to keep that in mind. MDO, TRADOC, FORCECOM, this is our new stuff. We've got to look at the operational environment. We know it's going to be contested in all domains. Which are 38 golfs? Yeah. If we can get them trained and consolidated at the KCOM or Brigade level, they're focused on their particular AOR, Indo PACOM, US Indo PACOM, for instance. That team can look at those countries and see of those 13 mega cities that are in Indo PACOM, yes, some of them are in China. But, you know, we won't be able to work them, but think of the ones that we can with our unified action partners. Going back to the 38 golf. We're looking at those critical factors, security, justice, reconciliation, humanitarian assistance, 
And now you put together a playbook, put it on the shelf, and it all goes back to that civil affairs area study. Are we doing them at those levels? Do we know what's going on in that particular AOR? And can we pull a playbook off the shelf, flip it over? Hey man, I know where all the water treatment plants are in Jakarta, Indonesia. I know that there are seven rivers. Where do they originate from? Which is going to be at the choke point? Who is in charge of the Ministry of Water in these areas? You know, we just keep constant tab. It's information. When the time comes, we can work with staffers at Indopaycom, and then we can affect our operation. I hope that answered your question. No, it did, because it's mega cities. They need a greater evolution of cat teams. Yes. And Would a standard four-person cat actually work in a mega city? This is where we got to figure out, from an Imto perspective, what may have worked or may not worked in the CENTCOM AOR in Afghanistan and Iraq, is it really going to work in a mega city? It seems like cat teams are the jack of all trades, they as are. they are at the moment. So for the mega cities, could they maybe focus more, like one focus on more subterranean aspects, another one maybe focus on power grids. So with that, I would actually charge that CAT team leader. Even if you haven't graduated from the 38 Alpha Pipeline, you're stuck, you're in phase three, you're in phase four. I would actually challenge our CAT team leaders at the uh, CA company level. Get out there and do that training. Like here, where we are in Maryland, we can go to a water station, we can go to the power plant, start learning what American infrastructure looks like. See if you coordinate with the city of Waldorf or the city of Miami, if you're down in 350, Go look at the power grid at the CAT team level, right? Go look at a power substation. Figure out, talk to the experts, see how it works. Develop a playbook. Find out how sewage works. Water treatment facilities. That way you know what American standards look like. When you walk into uh, Mumbai, you're not confused. and You're just learning it from the ground up. At least you have a base knowledge. But like you said, Sarah, we are jacks of all trades. Really masters of none. But that's where we reach out to our unified action part. We identify those key personnel in those indigenous populations and institutions. We know who our NGO partners are. We've got the reach back here at CONUS. We know who our Ford Engineering support team is, or we have to know these people to bring them out to do a, an assessment with us. Use the JSIM forms, the Joint Civil Information Management forms that are put out in conjunction, I believe, with the 95th CA, use of KPOC, and SWIC, I believe, and they just came up with standardized forms on how to do assessment. Yeah, we're not bridge experts, but we can actually use that assessment form to figure that out. Push it back, right? We just did civil engagement, civil reconnaissance. We're gonna get this information into SIM, push it up. The CMOC's gonna push it out. Now I can affect civil affairs operations support to the staff and everybody becomes well-rounded. And then if I'm really confused, I'm gonna go grab that engineer. That guy who's got the degree in civil engineering, I'm gonna take him out with me. That's how we do it. We're not an island. We're working with everybody else. We have to, we're people people. So I'll return to the interview with Major James Ontiverios in just a moment, but the Civil Affairs Association continues its value to its members by having a professional advisory board and an excellent research library on many different topics to support civil affairs and its ever-changing needs. The Civil Affairs Association is an advocate for civil affairs within the DOD community. Membership costs are low, and the benefit of belonging to the Civil Affairs Association will expand one's knowledge of global and military topics within the civil affairs community. So please consider stopping by the Civil Affairs Association and supporting its cause. Thank you. So to pick kind of back up with uh, civil engagements with the civil affairs teams as they kind of go out, when looking at the differentiations of what we have practiced and have done in terms of Afghanistan and Iraq, now we're going to these mega cities. How do you think when you now are going to an area with different neighborhoods, whether they're high class, low class, middle class, neighborhood with single family homes versus high rises structures? Sarah, you just hit on a complexity that nobody's really talking about. We think, are we still in that frame of mind where we're thinking Iraq, Afghanistan, a CTC rotation where I'm driving to a modular connex village where I'm talking to the sheikh or the leader of the populace. You hit it on the head, right? In a mega city. I'm looking at stratification of income. The rich folks, the middle class, and the disproportionate, probably larger population of people who are just poor, who are making do with what they can. How do you conduct civil engagement with these different stratas? And that is going to be a problem set that we need to figure out now rather than try to learn it while we're on. 
especially like how do you get people to really talk to you especially if you know they they feel they're doing fine or they see you as an outsider that you can't know any of their problems because you're not from there it all goes back to building rapport you know just getting down doing the grip and grin have a drink not alcoholic of course right <laughs> but you're just having a drink you're getting to know the individual on a personal level yeah i might only be here for a year but i need to know what your problems are human to human interface you're not an icon on a blue force tracker you're a real flesh and blood man or woman sitting in front of me with problems that i need to know about again we're not a humanitarian organization but if i can help you in the civilian component that way i'm mitigating your interference in the military operation that's how i need to do it and that kind of leads into both uh, the resource usage of it as well as possibly security aspects. Like if there is an underground element that the ones who might be doing more in the higher class might feel like a target. And so for them, it's security. And they could say, well, you're not doing enough of it for what we do. And all the resources seem to go to the lower end of the shanty towns. And the shanty towns, them could be the bigger, higher security when theirs might be a little bit different or even say that we have rolling blackouts or we don't have enough in terms of internet connectivity. When we look at the resource control, that's extremely important Absolutely. about what they really want. And we have to be able to balance everybody's needs, right? Because we want to mitigate their interference mm -hmm. in military operations and vice versa. Because we don't want to strip all everything away from those upper class folks. Because what if they're the ones who start feeling the insurgency? They can also feel disenchantment with civil affairs and the yes. U.S. military coming in. It's like, oh, they can't do anything they're for us anyway. They're just taking care of these folks over here. They're completely ignoring us. No, it's just where we have to strike those balances. And, you know, that's where we, as civil affairs officers and NCOs, sit with the maneuver commander during those leader engagements. The commander's talking to the power players on the other side of the table. We're advising the commander, he or she, to make sure we're getting the information across to them. I guess it is. I mean, they're so complex. You look at it from one angle and you start seeing like 10 other angles that you never thought of and they lead into even more questions and resource control issues. And I know I've gone back to it plenty of, too many times, I think, but it's the civil affairs team leaders and civil affairs NCOs that need to start looking at it from the U.S. perspective. What systems, What? how does infrastructure work here in the States? Because like you said, you've got these affluent areas that are being provided for with critical infrastructure. Yeah. But then you've got these shanty towns that are just built up, you know. They have no running water. How do we help them in order to help the populace, keep them out of military operations? So we just have to strike that balance, building that rapport. But we're going to make mistakes. Are we going to focus on that mistake for the next nine months of our deployment? Or am I going to fix it and move forward, keep going? And it kind of comes back to even working with the host nation, the government, mm -hmm. on Ab how much absolutely. they're willing to help. Yeah, we're not doing this in a vacuum. We're doing this by, with, and through the host nation, NGOs, OGA. We're working this with everybody. It's just not us. We're, this is a joint fight, unified action partner. But we are the experts in the civil component. That's where we need to step up and really make that happen. With civil affairs, sometimes they're not the only ones that are providing social services. And that's probably one of the big reasons why we need to get into some of these mega cities and these dense urban areas, just to be more for the beneficial of both the people and the government and to give that kind of support to legitimacy. Because you do have other groups, so they're trying to do the same thing. I mean, look how easy the Taliban took over in Afghanistan. And part of it was they were willing to provide some of the social services. Now, like you had put a term called Red CA. Can you explain what that is and go into depth with that? So it was just something I thought of, right? I was whiteboarding the concept for the special warfare article. I was just whiteboarding it. And at SWIC, the cadre I worked with always knew that like, I was always on the whiteboard just trying to map stuff out. And as I was doing the uh, mind map, I was like, man, what about Red CA? Boom, there's a gentleman, Lieutenant Colonel James Love, who was one of our instructors at CGSC back in 15, who wrote an article, and that article, let me see if I remember, go, if folks go to the JSAL Library, Joint Special Operations University, look for a monograph called Hezbollah, Social Services is a Source of Power. And he goes into depth with how Hezbollah is able to leverage social services to further their needs. And it all goes back to multi-domain operations. That operational environment, we're gonna be contested in every single domain. Land, sea, air, space, cyber, boom. Guess what, civil. 
So if we've got red CA, think of that red diamond with the CA right in the middle. That's who we're trying to compete against in the operating environment. How am I trying to think two, three steps ahead of this proxy force who's trying to counter everything that I'm doing by doing the same thing I'm doing? Our doctrine is out there. Anybody can get on the internet and look up civil affairs doctrine. Who's to say that our enemies, our adversaries right now aren't teaching our doctrine somewhere else? So we go toe to toe with these folks. They're using RTTPs against us. You know, man, it's going to be a prize fight. You know, how are we going to win this? That's where that creative and critical thinking is going to come from those uh, senior colonels who had fought in Iraq and Afghanistan as majors and cat team leaders and CMOC chiefs who are now at the KCOM or the brigade levels working in the civil affairs planning teams or civil liaison teams all the way down to the young soldiers who are going to be operating in these environments. You know, we've got near peer adversaries out there. We're looking to to challenge them in all the domains, but how sharp are we in content fighting them in the civil environment? That is a problem set that we don't even have a grasp on. How am I gonna fight the other CA dude with the red diamond trying to counter everything I'm doing? I mean, organized crimes and black market could have been providing foods and certain goods like soaps and shampoos and stuff. How you kind of dismantle that and get more of a legitimate trade yeah. on that and economic aspects. And guess what, Sarah? Like, I don't speak the language. You put me in Indonesia, I don't speak Maybe. Bahasa Indonesia, but I got that guy who was being used as a proxy with the near peer peer adversary who is doing the same thing I'm doing, but to counter my effort. You know, how am I gonna get down with that? Whether I'm in US AFRICOM, US CENTCOM, UCOM, problem set. Now it's up to us right at our level now to start thinking of these problems and coming up with those solutions. Yeah, man, that red diamond CA, it's going to hit us and we're not even going to know what happened, man. And they might be like, oh, if you work with them, we're going to stop the services to you. Now you have the populace turning against you. Yep. That really is a, a challenge. And as we look at it yeah. in terms of a mega city, right, we were talking about, I can be in New York City, cross the street. I just left Little Italy. Boom, now I'm in Chinatown. Imagine in an environment that we don't never been in, where the people in this building, hey, they're all for the U.S., but across the street, man, I walk across it, they'll get me. How are we going to do this when I don't speak the language? language. I don't know the culture, right? That's where a CA is where we come in. Culturally astute, language proficient. And that's why I would challenge our CA team leaders and NCOs right now that are out on the in the formations, man, start picking up that second language that's working in your AOR. Do it through SOFT, Special Operation Forces Teletraining Service. It's almost like a dadgum Skype with an instructor and you're only speaking in that target language. Get that Rosetta Stone. Start learning basic phrases. You don't have to be an expert at Mandarin. You don't have to be an expert at Arabic, Farsi. Man, just enough to build that rapport and you're starting to develop yourself professionally. It seems like the knowledge of mega cities is starting to grow because if you actually start doing research yes like that, it was touched on back in the 80s and it just kind of a couple years ago is like oh wait a minute now the battlefield is kind of changing to these mega cities in these greater dense urban areas and the marines have been doing some training on it who are the perfect experts for that right our marine corps brethren civil affairs <laughs> working on the issues of littoralization those are the experts we use the k-pop personnel we need to reach out to our Marine Corps brothers and sisters. They're CA element. And we start, We need to start sharing them. Because once we get boots on the ground, and I hate the cliches, but once we get on the ground, we're not trying to be territorial or this is my lane or your lane. No, we're working jointly like we're supposed to. We've been talking about mega cities in a permissive environment. You know, there's no armed conflict. As you look at multi-domain operations, right? The operating environment, we're looking at everything is contested. Every single domain, land, sea, air, space, cyber, contested. I mean, the ground is becoming increasingly lethal with the expanded battlefield. Before the interview, you had mentioned the Urban Canyon. Imagine standing on Broadway, lower Manhattan, and you just look up. 45 degrees, raise your head. You've got towers above you. Imagine what those maneuver elements are trying to figure out as they're moving through there. It's becoming an increasingly complex environment. Man, we haven't even talked about drone swarms. You know, imagine our soldiers 15, 20 years from now 
you know, my kids getting out there and getting after it. And now they're attacked by drone swarms. We got the internet of things, smart cities, everything's connected. There's talk of that in China, facial recognition is huge. Imagine that looking at just how expanded this battlefield is, not only physically, and we're talking like the urban canyon, X, Y, the Z plane. I'm looking at skyscrapers. I'm looking at sewer systems below me. The information as well. How many people have a Twitter? Facebook, Instagram, you know, they got the IG. What if the enemy starts getting a click on that, especially in that type of environment? Everybody's tweeting, they're texting, they're Facebooking, FaceTime. Enemy can get a hold of that data. Now they can build composite pictures of what units actually look like. Increasingly lethal on that expanded battlefield. An increasingly complex environment that we haven't even started dreaming of the problems we're gonna have. Think of a drone swarm with aerosol. You know, I was reading a study about drones that are used for spraying agricultural products and pesticides. Mm -hmm. Imagine a swarm coming out of nowhere, spraying our guys with stuff like that. And then we're always gonna have challenge deterrence. So like the doctrine says for multi-domain operations, right? We're gonna compete, we're gonna penetrate, we're gonna disintegrate, exploit civil affairs, right? We're gonna consolidate those gains and produce those stabilizing conditions or the sustainable conditions. Is what we're doing sustainable? And we're gonna secure that terrain in conjunction with our maneuver forces and really work with those populations, like get down into it. Because yeah, with all the technology we have available, nothing beats a face-to-face, -face, a grip and grin, sit, drink some chai, get to know the individual, and just build that rapport. You know, back to what Colonel Wilcox always talked about. Civil engagement, civil reconnaissance, building that rapport. Do you think they should have a mega city combat unit? John Spencer had actually talked about that, and I really liked his article, and yes, I know that other organizations are starting to look at that as well, but how how maneuver focused are they, right? The focus is on maneuver. Boom, back to branch principle number three. The civil component is a critical factor in all military operations. We're not being incorporated, then we need to figure that out at companies, CA teams, and CA battalions within UCK POC. How are we going to get that done? That kind of comes back to the, the Army and the Marines training together. Right? Yes. Now, do you think they're putting enough training to try to replicate it? That's a really good question. It's a very difficult question because now we're talking force management, we're talking almost at the component level. This is stuff that operational planning teams at the division core are probably looking at right now. But yeah, we really do need to start focusing more. And this is where, you know, with this podcast, hopefully folks are listening, just fires up those brain cells like, hey man, how are we going to challenge it? How are we going to figure out these problems in the future? You know, because in the future, man, we're looking at that near peer, peer adversary that's looking to kick our tail, whether it's through proxies. And right, we talk about gangs, transnational uh, criminal organizations, pirates. People laugh when they hear pirates. But look what's happened on the coast of Somalia. You influence those folks to come against us. What are we going to do? Now, do you think the military is actually taking the complexity of mega cities serious enough and planning the battlefield and humanitarian aspects to that? So that's a very difficult question because what the first cavalry division? What is their commander thinking? I don't know. What is the commander of the 82nd Airborne thinking? The 10th Mountain Division, climb the glory. They're looking to fight the battles of tomorrow, win, defeat the adversary. Right? Boom! Compete penetrate, disintegrate, exploit, recompete. Those are those tenets of multi-domain operations. A commander at that level is probably thinking, what's happening in these domains? Space, land, sea, cyber, information. Now I gotta be like, hey sir, ma'am, now we gotta think about the civil component. Let's be brilliant at the basics at our level in terms of civil engagement, civil reconnaissance, SAM, CMOC, CAO, staff support. And then when I come to the commander and present her with these solutions to these problems they're having, it builds the legitimacy within the Civil Affairs Regiment. And that's what we want to do, whether it's special operations or conventional forces. Is it more Civil Affairs pushing for it, or is it the rest of the Army saying, oh, I'm gonna wait a minute. Okay, so when you ask that, well, I'm looking at it from the rest of the Army, right? I yeah. was at the Special Warfare Center for three years. Yeah. I had the opportunity to apply for a strategic broadening seminar for dense urban areas, and our lab was in New York City. Our enabling cadre, those two gentlemen were awesome. Well, and one of them was a retired Air Force colonel, the other was the commander, former commander of the asymmetric warfare group. 
people they brought in during this seminar expand our minds on dense urban areas was mind-blowing. And what was awesome about this, in our seminar group, they were from every branch. We had 11 alphas, we had guys in the armor, we had medical service, we had a PA, and we're all looking at these problems from a mega city. And here I am like, man, this is where we win big in civil affairs, right? Let the guys who understand and are experts at maneuver handle maneuver. I'm gonna go look at the civil component. Let me try to get down and dirty and figure out these different areas. And going back to that, you had asked the question, how diverse are mega cities? In Military Review, can't remember who the author was, but they published. It was a quick three page article based on the language used in Twitter for IP addresses in New York City. It was mind blowing. The amount and different variants of different languages in this U.S. NORCOM mega city. And that's what we need to be working on in civil affairs. And this is where, you know, I challenge those civil affairs lieutenants and captains that are cat team leaders. You're where the rubber meets the road. Figure out, be an expert at civil engagement, civil reconnaissance, figure out your SIM piece, work through your CMOP. But if you're just kicking it at battle assembly and you're not going out into your local community and talking to the guy who operates a dump truck, you're talking, you're not talking to the guy who can explain why a transformer hangs at the height it does, what these power lines actually do. Where is the power step down station? How does it go from 220 to 110 for the house? This is what you need to be doing, civil affairs team leader. Talk to your company commander, brief it during your YTB, get out there. And guess what? You're doing civil engagement, civil reconnaissance, CONUS, you're getting the practice, and then when we go out there and you don't speak the language, whether it's Bahasa Indonesia or Arabic, at least you have the foundation to conduct that CR and CE, civil engagement, civil reconnaissance, with your interpreters. How willing do you think some of the governments or even the higher military would be willing to listen to civil affairs? It's how we compose ourselves, right? the more knowledge you learn here in the States. When I was at the 25th ID, you know, back in the mid 90s, as a specialist, there was on our wall of the barracks, you know, the more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in combat. That axiom applies in this instance. Like we were just talking, man, get those CAT team leaders, those CA and COs, sorry to forget you guys, you know, but you guys are just as important as that CAT team leader. Man, go get down with it because to your point, Sarah, we talked about multi-domain operations that's compete, penetrate, disintegrate, exploit, recomplete, man. We're, recon we're consolidating those games and providing sustainable outcomes. Planting trees, is that sustainable? Are we listening to what the focus groups in the communities are saying? If we're not, we need to reorient our azimuth and get back on track by being experts at our core competencies. Civil affairs activities, civil affairs supported activities, military governance operations. That's what provides that le legitimacy to those maneuver commanders we're going to support. Like, hey, sir, hey, ma'am, I understand you're looking at it from your maneuver perspective with your elements. The S2 is briefing you on the enemy capabilities, most likely, most deadly. Ma'am, sir, this is what I'm providing you in terms of the civil component. It's easier said than done. Man, it is difficult. You got to get down and get with it, meeting people, civil engagements, understanding infrastructure, civil reconnaissance. All we got to do, like Colonel Pat Work said in that podcast, you got to be brilliant in the basics. These yeah. basics are difficult for us. If we can train them here, CONUS, refine our processes, we find ourselves in a city of Jakarta, Indonesia, 32 million people in the metro, but I'm dealing with one of the slums. One of the things I would push to the CA teams out there in the force is get on Google Earth. Use the Google streets. Go through these littoral areas. Go through these mega cities because those Google cameras and cars have already been there. Learn the terrain. Understand how people get rid of their waste. Civil reconnaissance. You know, how do they get fresh water? How do they get their food? What type of economy is it? Black market economy? Is there stuff that's actually being sold on the open market? Who's controlling all this? Civil reconnaissance. It's all about resources and things like that on what different parts of the city because it is so huge. huge what one may value in terms of a resource the other one may not and it's about finding the information and that kind of comes down to more the giant urban mega cities go like over in Korea Korea has oh, many yes. of them Seoul humongous city but compare that to say Lagos Nigeria yes mega city there too but they have However, different Kaba. parts of me yes looking at that asset South Korea say they have an earthquake or tsunami hit we might bring in the civil affairs component to help out with them too. And you've also got the threat from their neighbors to the north. And they're well within the range of those artillery, that indirect fire, well within the range. But everything I've read, the Koreans are prepared for. Seoul, the city, is prepared for this kind of power.
you go back to Lagos, Nigeria, the infrastructure isn't there for the most part. The control, the regulations, they may not be as stringent or as prevalent as they are in a major modern city like Seoul. Tokyo, another example. You know, so what do we do? We're going to have to shift. And that's why I think at the KCOMs, a question you had asked before, create these operational planning teams. Southcom, 350. Indo-PACOM, 351. 352. RKCOM, 353. You're looking at Africa, looking at Europe. Start building these capabilities. Develop these area studies. It was, you know, it's in the back of our manual. Start building these out for these large major metropolitan areas. Figure out what works, what doesn't. And then we start building our database, consolidate it as part of our sim, and then we can push it down to lower levels. And then when our CAT team leader, she's out there, right? Our Alpha 450 a team leader is out there in some mega city in the future. And she's like, she's got the area study that she got from KPOC to KCOM to Brigade. She's looking at it like, oh, that's not right. She makes the changes, updates it in the, you know, whatever system we're using in 20, 30 years, real time up to date data, information, and we're managing it. But we just got to get better at it. We have to start looking in the future. You're really, because this is going to be a complex problem. We have to cultivate our 38 bombs as well. Look at those functional specialty areas. Justice and reconciliation. I know I would keep going over, but humanitarian assistance, social well-being, governance and participation, economic stabilization infrastructure. We have to start recruiting 38 golfs. People in the civilian sector who have these capabilities who are going to help forward U.S. policy in the future immediately reduce or alleviate that humanitarian suffering. You know, and like you had asked, the army at large, I think they are looking at the problem. And then you've got a lot of other folks that are looking at it as well. The West, the guys at USMA, the United States Military Academies, Modern Warfare Institute. Again, John Spencer, Urban Warfare Studies section. There is uh, Dr. Russell Glenn, who is at Tradoc G2, who has an entire series of writings on Rand's website. Again, you know, the Civil Affairs Association, call for papers. Think, write, submit. People are going to blast you out of the water. But hey, you're learning from it, man. You're getting your ideas out there. It's like with the article I did for Special Warfare. Right? I think I was most critical to myself, and I cut pages and pages out of it. But, you know, I was thinking like, oh, man, people are going to laugh at this. But no, man, think, write, post, submit. You just learn. You just get that much better from it. Modern Warfare Institute, Urban Warfare Studies. Listen to what John Spencer, John Amble, and those that crew over there at West Point are doing. You know, Dr. Russell Grant Glenn again. Go through his archives and rant. It'll just open up a world of what are urban military operations going to look like. What can serve the future? Small Wars Journal is another good source. They actually have an anthology out. It's like three inches thick. And it's uh, Blood and Concrete, 21st Century Conflict in Urban Centers and Mega Cities. Go to Amazon.com or go to the library, pick up Concrete Hell, Urban Warfare from Stalingrad to Iraq by Dr. Louis DeMarco, who's a faculty at CGSC in Fort Leavenworth. You know, out of the mountains. You can't go wrong with uh, Dr. Kilcullen, The Coming Age of the Urban Gorilla. If you're out there in the force right now, man, apply for that Dense Urban Area Strategic Broadening Seminar. You're just going to learn so much. Go to Small Wars Journal, read that. While I was at CGSC, I was reading a book called Concrete Health. I can't remember what the subtitle is, but it's written by Louis DeMarco. He's talking about urban warfare from Stalingrad to Iraq. Go to the call, Center for Army Lessons Learned website. Pull up the Mosul study group, read that. And my favorite one is the Mad Scientist Laboratory. Go to blog post number 181, all about mega cities. It's a complex, difficult problem set that we're gonna face in the future. And we have to get our troops at the junior enlisted and junior officer level ready to conduct these operations, whether it's in a permissive environment as much as it can during a humanitarian or natural disaster to all out conflict, man, where, you know, we're fighting a peer adversary in the city. Just like Colonel Pat Work said, it's just that slow, that grinding, slow grinding combat that's going to wear on you physically, mentally, emotionally. We have to be ready for that. And we cannot forget that we are there to support the maneuver commander.
any further research or papers you would recommend besides those you've mentioned? I also go Google Earth, Google Street. If you belong in 353 and you're looking at, let's say, Singapore, or an OPT has taken a look at Manila, cities that are littoral areas, go through Google Streets. Best way to do it. But other than that, yeah, you know I get very passionate about this topic, but we're not looking at the map of uh, me in 1998 at Fort Drum supporting 214 Infantry. You know, we're running through the woods. We're knocking it out with the Op 4. We get to the Mount City Index. I'm like, well, what would happen after? Like, yeah, we occupy the buildings. Everybody takes their ruck. We start wiping our camo off, you know reapplying, shaving, eating a meal. I'm like, well, what really happens in the aftermath? Boom, 2035. Now we gotta start looking at the future. It's not simple. You're looking at the X axis, the Y axis, but now we also worry about the Z. What's above us in terms of skyscraper? What's below us? And then the technology that's incorporated with all this, the internet of things, hey. social media presence. It's gonna be huge. Hey, cities are where all the people are at and where the government is, where civilization lies. And the mega cities, that's where we're gonna be in the future. Yeah, imagine. And we do something wrong, we're not following our own guidelines, or an air round hits mm -hmm. a school, we could possibly turn an entire populace against us. And with social media, imagine how quickly that would be broadcast. Right. We think about what happened in Somalia in 1993. Nobody had the internet back then, but we saw it on CNN. Imagine if somebody captures it, sort of like what happened in Iran with the Green Revolution. People getting beaten in the streets. That was instant Twitter feed. And we're looking at this in 2000, I think it was 2009. I'm like, wow, man, this is instantaneous. Imagine it now where they could be live streaming us or clip, copy, edit, film, push it out. And now they're using it as information operations warfare against us. Very diverse. And like multi-domain operations, it's all encompassing. Mega cities is a problem set that's going to encompass all the domains. ACA, man, let's get down and get with it with the civil component. Oh, is there any follow-ups we haven't covered today? Or? No. Again, you know, if it's a civil affairs team leaders down in the force, man, get your people out there. Go talk to the city government, man. Start building those relationships. Sewer, water, electric, rash fuel, medical, how does it work in the United States? We get deployed, we got a leg up on the operation because we know what Ryan looks like. But those young soldiers, those captains, those lieutenants, the sergeant, the staff sergeant, sergeant first class, every of those guys within a cat team, they're the ones who are gonna make this happen. We're just coming up with the concepts. Those are the guys that are probably gonna execute in the future. So hopefully we'll see some more, a lot more training coming up with it and even specialty fields, whether it might be for electricity, grids and power. Absolutely. Uh, other type of resources, water, system sewer systems and specialized trainings and hopefully led by a lot more 38 golfs that absolutely would, that would be great to be under them it's a good it's it's a great concept we just need to cultivate it and get them out there their time to shine on that oh absolutely <laughs> well thank you once again major james Ontiverius, for being part of the ca1 podcast thank you so much Sarah. Really i appreciate it. it all right well thank you and i hope you all have a great day